Lesson 1 Relationships in a family A family consists of parents and their children. A family may also include parents, their children, grandparents, uncle, aunt and their children. Relatives also play an important role in our lives. Some of us do not have brothers and sisters. We are lucky if we have brothers and sisters. They belong to us and share our memories. They are always there to support and help us. Families always get together on occasions like festivals, New Year and birthdays. This is Rohit's family. He is very happy today. His mother has given birth to a baby girl. Till yesterday, there were five people living in Rohit's house. Rohit his parents and his grandfather and grandmother. Today, there are six members. Rohit also has an aunt, Nidhi, and uncle Satish. His aunt lives with her husband and children in another city. Rohit's uncle, Satish, is still unmarried. He is in USA for higher studies. The Family Album Rohit's Family Rohit's mother took out the family album and stuck a photograph of the little baby. She pointed to the photographs of some other people whom Rohit had rarely met. He asked his mother about those people. His mother explained that they, too, were her relatives. Before she was married, she lived in a big house with her parents. Two brothers, uncle, aunt, and their two children. After marriage, she moved to this city with Rohit's father. Some of these photographs in the album were of the people among whom his mother grew up as a child. Rohit was somewhat confused. He could not understand exactly how he was related to all these people in the photographs. So his mother drew a family tree for him. Family Album Grandfather, 70 years Grandmother, 65 years Father, 38 years Mother, 35 years Uncle Satish, 28 years Uncle Harshit, 42 years Aunt Nidhi, 40 years Rohit, 9 years Baby, Isha, 18 years Pooja, 15 years. Rohit's family. Your mother as a child. Rohit saw some photographs of his mother as a young girl. He was surprised to see how his mother had changed. His mother told him that everyone changes as they grow older. Many things about them change. Example, the way they look, their habits, the things they like their way of dressing and even the way they think. It was easy for Rohit to understand that. His likes and dislikes changed every day. He used to love chocolates, but now he liked fruits like apples and bananas. He used to enjoy playing with toy cars and dolls, but now he only watched cartoons on TV. Is there something you like more now? than you did earlier? Rohit had many more questions. He was especially keen to know more about his mother's life. Wouldn't you also like to know more about your mother? Ask your mother these questions and note down her answers in the space given below. Who were the relatives she lived with when she was your age? Where did they live? Where did she study? Ask her the name of her school. Quick revision. Our immediate family includes our mother, father, brother, sister and grandparents. When children grow up, they may not live with their parents. Our relatives also play an important role in our lives. Families always get together on occasions like festivals and family functions. Lesson 2. An extended family. The people we live with are the part of our immediate family. 
family members who live separately are the part of our extended family. We meet our extended family members on occasions which may be sad or happy. Uncle and aunt are extended family members. They are fun to be with and can teach us many good things. In an extended family, all the members follow the rules and rituals of the family. Even though they live in different places, this is known as following the family traditions. When relatives and family members meet, we learn about family traditions or sanskar. Picture title Immediate family, extended family. People hold special functions to celebrate important occasions. There are special ceremonies to welcome new babies into the world and other ceremonies for children at different stages of their life. Namkaran or naming ceremony. Rohit is looking pretty in his new dress. He is wearing a beautiful t-shirt and trousers. Today, his little sister is 11 days old and it is her namkaran or naming ceremony. Rohit's family has decided to name her Jyoti. They have invited most of their relatives and friends. Relatives from both sides of the family, her mother's and her father's side are present. Rohit's nana and nani, mother's parents, have come from Rurki. Rohit's uncle Harshit and aunt Nidhi and their two children have come all the way from Merat. Namkaran or naming ceremony. Rohit's uncle Satish has also arrived from USA. There is a lot of excitement and happiness in the family. Everyone is happy to meet one another. They have a lot to share and talk about. Learning from one another. Rohit is helping his mother and aunt to decorate the house. His mother has taught him about family traditions and good habits. He has made a beautiful rangoli outside the house. He learned this design from his aunt. Rohit is very fond of his uncle and aunt. They are very loving and affectionate. They have two daughters, Isha and Pooja. Pooja is 15 years old and very fond of music. She wants to start a music band when she is old enough. No one in the family has done this before. Isha is 18 years old. She is an engineering student. She will be the first female engineer in the family. Decision making. Rohit likes the way his uncle, aunt and their daughters take decisions. They sit down at the table and everyone is given a chance to say what they feel. Then the best option is chosen. Isn't it a good way to take an important decision? For example, Isha's parents were not very happy when she decided to study engineering. They thought she would find the course very tough. They also felt that she would not be able to live in the hostel in a different city. According to them, the profession was more suitable for men. But Isha believed that women could be good at any kind of job. When her parents realized how keen and firm Isha was, they agreed. Family Traditions and Values After the ceremony is over, Rohit's family members will go to the orphanage and donate clothes and food to the children there. His grandparents had started this tradition. They feel that it is important to help those who are not as lucky as they are because God loves those who serve their fellow men. They do this on every special occasion. Rohit has given away all his old books to the children there. If good values are passed on within a family, society will slowly change for the better. The world will become a better place to live in. Elders advise younger family members and share their experiences, both good and bad. We learn a lot from our family. 
here are a few values that we should learn wish elders and pay them respect speak softly and sweetly participate in family gatherings look after guests share worries and problems with elders take the advice and guidance of elders our family both immediate and extended is a very important part of our lives we must try and meet each other regularly and maintain good relationships we must also try and respect our family's traditions and values foster parents some families are different some children do not live with the parents they were born to but live with their adopted parents these parents are called foster parents and often is a child who does not have parents or was deserted by them such children live in orphanages sometimes people who do not have children adopt a child from an orphanage sometimes people adopt a child in spite of having children to give a good life to an orphan quick revision the people you live with in your home are a part of your immediate family other family members who live separately are a part of your extended family people hold special functions to celebrate important days and occasions we must respect and follow family traditions and values lesson 3 modern and traditional games we all follow a routine every day however life becomes very dull and boring if we do not take a break from our usual routine and work doing something different from the routine is called recreation it makes us feel relaxed and fresh that is why it is necessary that children play some games for a while in the evening we will learn more about modern and traditional games in this lesson games at school physical education includes exercises games and sports we have two physical education periods in a week in our school timetable during the physical education period we play games in the school playground the physical education teacher issues sports equipments to the children to play most schools keep sports equipments like bats balls stumps footballs hockey sticks nets etc for the students to play in school these sports equipments are kept in the sports room we have a big playground in our school we play different games in the school playground such as cricket hockey football volleyball etc these are called modern games recognize and write the names of the games the children are playing in each picture 1 2 3 rules of games all games have certain rules and regulations it is important to know the rules of the game we play in a team like cricket there is an umpire who makes sure that all the rules of the game are followed in football he is called a referee in school during the games period the games teacher conducts the games the teacher teaches the children the rules of the games of the day sometimes we do have arguments when somebody cheats during play when we play rough games we can get injured when someone breaks the rules we should not fight or quarrel we should sort out the problem soon and restart the game playing games according to the rules makes us disciplined and we can enjoy the game other games we play with our friends look at the pictures of some other games we play with our friends these games are called traditional games indoor games and outdoor games we play many games in schools and at home games that we play inside are called indoor games we play games like chess snakes and ladders and carrom in our homes these games are called indoor games besides playing we also read story books watch television etc 
to entertain ourselves. Games like cricket, football, hockey, etc. that we play in the ground are called outdoor games. Playtime is the best time of the day. We always enjoy while playing. Playing together helps us make new friends. We cheer our friends who play well. While playing together, we learn to cooperate, share and work together. It helps to build team spirit. Quick revision. Playing is a good exercise for our body. It keeps us physically fit and strong. There are two types of games, outdoor and indoor games. While playing together, we learn to cooperate, share and work together. We should follow the rules of the games. Lesson 4. Feeling around with eyes shut. Touch is the name given to the action of putting your fingers or hands on something. When we touch something, our fingertips press one or more nerves. These nerves carry the message to our brain. The brain helps us identify the object. We can always touch something and tell what it is. The result of a touch is called sensation. Some areas of our body are more sensitive to touch than others. Let us find out if some parts of your body are as sensitive to touch as the others. Your fingertips and your tongue are more sensitive than your back. Ask your friend to touch your back with two unsharpened pencils held close together. You will feel that your friend is using only one pencil. However, your fingertips can feel the sensation of both the pencils easily. This is because in your sensitive areas, example your fingertips, the nerves are closer together than they are in less sensitive parts. That is why you can feel more with your fingertips. It is the same with the soles of your feet. They too are very sensitive to the sense of touch. Good touch and bad touch. How do you feel if someone hits you or slaps you? How do you feel when you get a hug or you get a pat on the back? Do you feel uncomfortable when someone touches you? If you do, then keep away from such people. Tell your partner or teachers about it. They will help you. Sense of smell. Senses of smell and touch are very useful. These senses are well developed in those who cannot see or hear. They depend on the sense of smell and touch. Just as your sense of touch tells you about various objects and sensations, your nose helps you differentiate between good and bad smells. Do you get to know when your neighbor is frying fish in his kitchen? This is because tiny bits of chemicals from the fish float around in the air. The tiny particles float into your nose through your nostrils. After entering your nostrils, the air moves up into a space at the top of the nose. This space is covered with special smelling cells. The odor sticks to these cells and sends nerve signals to the brain. The brain then identifies the source of the smell and tells you what it is. With each breath you take, your nose tells you something about the air around you. Some smells are pleasant, like the smell of a rose flower or good food. Some smells, like those of garlic, ginger and mustard oil, are very strong. Some people find them very unpleasant. Their immediate reaction is to cover their nose. Some smells are very foul, such as the smell of a dead rat or any other decomposing body, the smell of an open gutter, animal or human excreta or stale water that is closed in a jar. Some people are very sensitive or allergic to certain smells. They may not like the smell of certain kinds of food. We should respect the feelings of those who do not like strong smells. Though some people may be allergic to them, 
most people find the smell of room fresheners, perfumes, deodorants and aftershave lotions very pleasant. The good smell of these products has the ability to cover other foul smells. Differently abled people Senses of smell and touch are very useful senses. These senses are very well developed in those who cannot see or hear as they depend more on these senses. Blind people use their sense of touch to read and write. They use a special system known as Braille. It is a code in which raised dots represent letters of the alphabet. Braille was developed by Louis Braille in 1824, who himself was blind. Quick Revision Touch is the name given to the sensation transmitted by your nerve endings from every part of the body. In your more sensitive areas, the nerves are closer together than they are in less sensitive parts. The good smell has the ability to cover other foul smells. Lesson 5 Plants, Parts and Their Functions Plants are living things. There are many kinds of plants. They grow all around us and vary in size and shape. Plants also have different parts for different functions. We can group the parts of plants mainly into root and shoot. The root. Some roots are big and strong while others are small and weak. Plants and trees that have weak roots can be destroyed by strong winds. Trees like the banyan have very deep roots and live for many years. There are two types of roots, tap roots and fibrous roots. Tap root When a main root grows from the end of the stem and many small roots grow from this main root, it is called a tap root. Plants like mustard, balsam and bean have tap roots. Fibrous root When a large number of roots grow from the end of the stem, it is called a fibrous root. Plants like rice, wheat, grass and onion have fibrous roots. Functions of a root The root fixes the plant to the soil. It takes in water and minerals from the soil and passes them to the stem. Many roots store food in them. We eat such roots. Have you seen a banyan tree? It has rope-like growths hanging down from its bigger branches. These hanging growths are a special type of roots called aerial roots. They act like pillars and support the heavy branches of the banyan tree. Thus, supporting or aerial roots provide additional support to the big banyan tree. Storage root Sometimes there is acute water shortage due to scanty rainfall. Lack of water leads to crop failures, which in turn leads to shortage of food. Storage roots such as sweet potato, tapioca and yam can be very useful in such situations and help people survive. These foods are useful in times of food shortage. The shoot. The part of the plant which is above the ground is called the shoot. The shoot bears stems, leaves, buds, flowers and fruits. All these parts perform important functions. Let us study about these parts. The stem. The stem grows above the ground. Functions of a stem. It supports the plant and keeps it upright. It bears branches. Leaves, flowers and fruits grow on these branches. The most important function of the stem is to carry water and minerals to the leaves. The leaves use this water and minerals to make food. The food prepared by the leaves is again carried by the stem to the different parts of the plant. The figure given on the right shows how water and food travel up and down in the stem. Some stems store extra food in them. We eat such stems like ginger, 
onion, potato and sugar cane that store extra food in them. Leaf The leaf is the most important part of the plant. Most plants have green leaves. The color of the leaves is green due to the presence of a green pigment called chlorophyll. The green leaves make food for the plant with the help of sunlight, carbon dioxide and water. When the leaves make food, they give off oxygen through the stomata. The oxygen is used by all living things to breathe. Many parts store extra food in their leaves. We eat the leaves of such plants, such as spinach, mint and cabbage. Parts of a leaf The flat and broad part of the leaf is called the leaf blade. In the middle of the leaf is the main vein. A number of side veins lead off from the main vein. These veins carry water to the leaf. On the lower surface of the leaf, there are very tiny pores called the stomata. The stomata help the plant to take in air for breathing. Flowers Flowers are the most beautiful part of a plant. They are found in a variety of colors. Some flowers have a pleasant, sweet smell. Flowers grow into fruits. Thus, they help the plant to reproduce. Who are attracted to flowers? Visit a garden which has many flowers. What do you see? Can you see insects sitting on the flowers? Birds and insects like honeybees and butterflies are attracted to flowers. They fly from one flower to another carrying pollen. Birds suck a sweet liquid called nectar from flowers. As they dip their beaks, their heads rub on the flowers covered with pollen. This way, they can carry the pollen to other flowers, thus helping in pollination. Honeybees live in hives. These hives are made of bee wax and consist of hexagonal cells. Each beehive may have more than 50,000 bees. There is only one queen bee. Others are worker bees and male bees called drones. Honeybees gather pollen in the baskets they have on their hind legs. They store the nectar in their honey stomachs. When they go back to their hive, they spit out all the nectar into the cells of their hive. The cells are sealed with the wax their bodies produce. Soon the nectar turns into honey. Do you know? Honeybees live longer in big groups called swarms. Fruits and seeds Most of the fruits have seeds inside them. Some fruits have only one seed, while others have many seeds. Seeds are protected inside the fruits. Each seed has a baby plant inside it. When a seed gets enough air, water and warmth, the baby plant starts growing. It is called germination. When it grows into a new plant, it bears its own leaves and starts making its own food. Functions of the fruits Fruits protect the seeds inside them. Most fruits contain food. Many seeds also contain food. We eat such fruits and seeds. Quick revision A plant has two main parts, the root and the shoot. There are two types of roots, tap roots and fibrous roots. The leaf prepares food for the plant. The flowers grow into fruits. Lesson 6 Plants and Trees Around Us Plants and trees are very useful to us. They give us food, wood, rubber, paper, medicines, etc. They also purify the air, give shade and provide shelter to people, birds and animals. They belong to all of us. They are an essential part of our environment. You can see different kinds of plants and trees in the forests, parks and along the roads. Forests Forests have plants and trees that grow naturally. Have you ever thought who grows plants and trees in the parks and along the roads? Let's learn about it. Who looks after trees? In cities and towns, it is the responsibility of the municipality to plant trees 
and flowering bushes along the roads. Usually, a metal cage is placed around the young saplings to protect them from being eaten by cattle or being uprooted or trampled upon. This is called a tree guard. The saplings are watered by water tankers sent by the municipality, especially in the summer season. In the rainy season, young trees get enough water from the rains. Trees are an important part of the wealth and resource of a country. The forests of every country are protected areas. The forest department protects the trees that grow in the wild. They also plant trees in forest areas. Trees are also grown in wildlife sanctuaries and biosphere reserves. These trees are numbered and nobody is allowed to cut them. Unfortunately, some greedy people cut down trees to make money by selling them. It is the responsibility of the forest department officials to prevent the cutting of trees. Wild plants Some plants grow wild around our neighbourhood and in the countryside. Some are undesirable because they do not let domestic plants grow and are called weeds. Some others are not good for health. However, there are countless wild plants that have great medicinal value and still more, whose value is still undiscovered. The majority of wild plants add beauty and variety to our lives. Let us learn about a few plants that are considered weeds. Congress grass grows commonly along roadsides, river banks, railway tracks and construction sites. This weed is known by many names in India, such as Gajarbuti, Chatak Chandni, Gajar Ghas, Gandhibuti or White Top. It is a threat to plants, animals and human beings as it causes skin problems and allergies. Daisies are white and small rounded wild flowers with spoon-shaped evergreen leaves. They can be found in hillsides or meadows. They cannot be easily destroyed and often grow like weeds in lawns. Daisies attract bees, butterflies and birds. Water hyacinth causes a lot of harm. Growing up to 3 feet in height, it has thick, waxy, rounded, glossy leaves, which rise above the water surface on long stalks. Besides blocking boat traffic and preventing swimming and fishing, water hyacinth prevents sunlight and oxygen from entering the water and gradually endanger aquatic life. Plants with Medicinal Properties There are some other wild plants which are useful to us. Some have amazing medicinal properties. Gotukola, Bringaraj and Amalaki support liver health. Amalaki and Gugula are used to cure or prevent heart problems. Trifla, Shilajit, Sarasaparilla root and Haritaki fruit benefit people with joint pain. People with stomach problems can find relief with Damiena, Hawthorn and Pipali. Domestic Plants Some plants and trees are grown in our homes. They are useful as they check dust, pollution, give shade and provide oxygen. They also give fruits and flowers. Some people have vegetable gardens or a small vegetable patch in their gardens. Some even grow plants such as mint, tulsi and coriander leaves in pots. People who have large gardens grow fruit trees. They plant guava, lemon, jamun, papaya, lychee, etc. But the kind of trees grown depends on the soil and climate of the region. Some trees are ornamental, that is, they add beauty to the garden. The Ashoka, Kadamba, Ficus, Kachnar and Dhak are some examples of ornamental trees. People living in forests Some people live in forests. They are known as tribals or adivasis. They survive on the plants and trees that grow there. 
They rear plant-eating animals and eat everything that wild animals eat. They eat coconuts, papayas, jackfruits, breadfruits, bananas, blackberries, wild mangoes, wild guavas and figs. Wild onions called chives and wild garlic are also found in the jungles. Tribals also eat young shoots of the bamboo and the inside of the banana trunk which is very tender. They eat the roots of some plants. Many people believe that forest dwellers are its best protectors. They look after the forest because their lives depend on them. Forest dwellers also have a good knowledge of medicinal plants. In drier areas, many acacia trees such as babul, kikar and kher grow. These trees provide beans and fruits that are bitter to taste but are healthy to eat. The jungli jalebi, lasur and kachnar flowers and fruits are eaten as well. The tribals in the forests and those that live at the edges of the forests have very strong teeth. It is believed that they can tear coconut fiber away from the nut. Even old people have their teeth intact. Forest people are careful not to eat poisonous plants. Bikhubuti, poison ivy and some harmful varieties of mushrooms are not eaten. Van Mahotsav Saptah Our government is taking many steps to protect trees. It has launched several programs to save forests and plant new trees. Van Mahotsav Sapta is a program in which people plant trees in large numbers in various parts of our country. Quick Revision Plants differ in their size, shape of leaves, fruits, seeds, bark, color of the flowers and leaves, smell and even the season in which they grow. Plants give us fruits and vegetables, purify the air, give shade and provide shelter to people, birds and animals. The forest department protects the trees that grow in the wild. Some plants called weeds do not let domestic plants grow. Tribal people survive on the plants and trees that grow there. Lesson 7 Communities of Animals We all live in villages, towns or cities. We also live together in colonies. Animals are also social beings like us. They also live together in groups. They have their territories as we have our boundaries. Wild animals live in forests while domestic animals live in farms or houses. Animals that move in groups Some animals like deer, zebras and elephants move about in groups. They move in groups looking for food and water. While they move in groups, the young ones are kept in the middle. It is dangerous to go near any animal that is with its young one. They will attack us as they think we may harm them. In most animal groups, a few members become group leaders and others remain followers. The leaders hold their position by fighting or showing their strength. They watch out for danger when other members of the group eat or sleep. The leader also fights the enemy to protect the group. The dog family includes foxes, wolves, jackals and coyotes. They move in groups called packs. A wolf pack territory may be very large. They are good hunters. Lions live in the grasslands or in jungles in groups called prides. Each pride may have 4 to 12 lionesses and their cubs. By the age of 2 years, a cub is sent off to start its own family. The females are ready to produce young ones at the age of 3 years. Hens and a few other bird species have a pecking order. In the pecking order, a single bird becomes dominant or most important. It pecks the others and feeds before them. Some insects like ants and termites live in colonies. Female elephants, called cows, 
live with their calves and younger bulls in herds of 20 to 30 animals. Older bulls usually live alone. When the leader of the herd senses danger, she lifts her trunk and trumpets loudly. If an enemy comes close to the herd, she charges at it with her head lowered. Giraffes, zebras, wild horses and deer move in herds for safety. They roam in search of grass and water over the grasslands. Shy animals Some animals are very friendly while others are extremely shy. Some animals are active in the night only because they are shy of human beings. You must have seen a squirrel in the garden. When we go near a squirrel, it runs away because it feels shy. When we go near a tortoise, it immediately draws its head into the hard shell it carries. Rabbits and monkeys are also shy animals. Have you tried to feed a cat or dog? Are they friendly? They are not shy. Cows, tamed elephants, hens, turkeys, ducks, geese, pigeons, sparrows and crows are also friendly. Any animal or bird that comes close to us and accepts food from us is a friendly animal. We must love and care for such animals. We should be careful while trying to touch a strange animal, as it may scratch or bite us. What is the reaction of rabbits, squirrels and monkeys if you go near them? They become friendly only when they are sure that they will not be harmed. Most of the friendly animals have been tamed by human beings as pets or domestic animals. Dolphins live in a big group called a school in the ocean. They swim along with people who swim in the sea. They are said to have saved many people from drowning. Remember that animals do not harm you unless they are startled, attacked or are afraid that you will harm them or their babies. Relationships in Nature White birds called cattle ergrets live near large animals such as cows, buffaloes and elephants. They do so because they eat the insects that are on the bodies of the cattle. Ergrets often perch on the backs of large animals. If the birds sense danger, they fly away, thus warning the cattle. Oxpeckers are small birds that ride on large animals such as rhinos, oxen and giraffes and peck the insects off their bodies. Remoras are small fish that ride upon top of turtles or large fish for protection and access to food. They eat the leftover scraps of the prey their host consumes. They also act as cleaner fish. But the bravest animal of all is the Egyptian plover. It is a tiny bird that cleans the teeth of crocodiles by sitting inside their mouths. The crocodiles never shut their mouths or try to eat it. Some insects like ants and termites live in colonies. Life in an ant colony is very organized. Their nest, called an anthill, may be underground, in a mound or even on a treetop. There are thousands of ants in an ant colony. The queen ant lays eggs and also lives the longest. Its lifespan varies between 10 and 20 years. The workers do most of the work. All workers are females. They carry for the queen and her young ones. They build and repair their homes. They also search for food and fight off enemies. Workers usually live between 1 to 5 years. Male ants are a few and they only live for a few weeks or months. They help the queen ant to produce young ones and die shortly afterwards. Bees and their life Bees are social by nature and live in colonies. These colonies can exist for several years. The domestic honeybees also live in colonies. They live in beehives made of wax. Nearly 50,000 to 80,000 bees live together in a hive. 
they are of three types the queen bee worker bees and drones they exhibit division of labor like human beings division of labor is very essential for harmony when we live in groups quick revision animals move about in groups as they feel safer when in large numbers lions live in the jungles in groups called prides birds also help each other in the group as we do bees are social by nature and live in colonies lesson 8 water the elixir of life water is the most abundant substance on the earth it covers more than 75% of the earth's surface it is the only substance which exists in three forms solid liquid and gas water is very important for us every day we use water in many ways we use it for drinking bathing washing cleaning cooking and putting out fire water is also used in schools offices and factories for various purposes animals and plants also need water plants need water to grow and prepare food they get water through their roots farmers use water to irrigate their crops animals need water for drinking and bathing because of so many uses water is often called the source of life do you know that 70% of our body weight is due to water we cannot live without water for more than a week without water our body will become restless the very first day all living things contain a large quantity of water look at the water contents in these pictures shortage of water in our body causes a serious disease called dehydration our body needs about 6 glasses of water every day sources of water we get water from many sources like ponds rivers streams lakes seas and oceans but the main source of water is rain all other sources entirely depend on rain when it rains the rain water goes into ponds lakes rivers and seas some rain water goes underground we call this underground water we get underground water through wells hand pumps and tube wells oceans oceans cover more than 2/3 of the earth's surface so the largest source of water on the earth are oceans however due to the presence of salts this water is not suitable for drinking rivers rivers are the most important sources of water rain water seeps through the soil and gets collected under the ground this water reaches the earth's surface in the form of springs springs are sources of fresh water in the mountains these springs are formed from small streams streams are also formed by the melting of ice and snow in the high mountains the streams join together and form a river the place where a river starts is called its source the gangotri glacier is the source of the river ganges lakes a lake is a body of water surrounded by land it is bigger than a pool or pond sometimes lakes are formed by melting glaciers some lakes are big and almost look like a sea the chilka lake in odisha is very big ponds ponds are smaller than lakes we generally find them in villages life in water the world under the oceans and seas is different there are mountains and valleys forests of seaweed and many amazing animals have you seen an aquarium it displays different kinds of fish found in the sea starfish are beautiful creatures with five limbs some sea creatures are gentle and friendly but others are fierce hunters sharks have sharp teeth with which they eat other sea animals dolphins are very gentle and playful creatures they are the most intelligent of all the sea animals 
thousands of different kinds of fish live in the sea. They have different shapes and sizes. Whales are the biggest animals in the world. Although they look like fish, they are mammals. There is also a variety of freshwater fish in the river. Water vanishes when heated. You must have seen puddles disappearing in a day or so. They dry up to form water vapour because of the heat from the sun. This process is called evaporation. You must have also seen water droplets on the outside of a cold glass water. The process of water vapour turning back into water is known as condensation. Let us understand how this works. Water cycle The water in lakes, rivers and oceans gets heated by the sun. It changes into water vapour and mixes with the air. The air rises high up in the sky and comes in contact with cold air. Due to a decrease in the temperature, the water vapour cools down into tiny droplets of water. These tiny drops of water cling together to form clouds. When the clouds become heavy, the water falls down as rain. The rainwater again goes to lakes, rivers and oceans. This water is again heated up by the sun to make water vapour. This makes a cycle known as water cycle. The water cycle is a never-ending process. Conserving water Most of the rain in India is brought by the monsoon winds. During monsoons, there is usually plenty of water for everyone. Since rain does not fall regularly throughout the year, it is important for us to conserve water. We conserve water by building reservoirs, dams and tanks. We store water in them till we need it. Large river canals are built to take water to places where there is not enough water. A canal is a channel of water taken from a river or a lake and used by farmers for irrigating their fields. Reservoirs are natural or artificial lakes in which water is stored. People use this water for irrigation or to supply for domestic uses or to generate hydroelectric power. A dam is a barrier or wall built across the river to hold back the water forming a reservoir. It has special gates which can be opened or closed to control the flow of water. Some dams are built to produce electricity, store water and provide water for irrigating fields. Such dams which have many uses are known as multi-purpose projects. The Bhagranangal Dam on the river Satluj is the biggest dam in India. Can you name some other dams in India? Purification of water Water from the rivers and reservoirs is not fit for drinking. So, before this water can be supplied to homes, it must be purified to remove impurities and germs. This is done in water treatment plants. After it is filtered, chemicals are added to make the water pure. This makes water free from both dust and germs. The purified water is then supplied to houses. After purification, water is collected in big tanks. From these tanks, it reaches our homes through big pipes. When we open our taps, it is this water that we get. In villages, people dig wells and use tube wells to get underground water. Some use of rainwater, which gets collects in ponds or tanks. If a stream is near the village, they may get water from it. Cleaning water. Sometimes in the rainy season, tap water becomes unfit to drink. If we find the water dirty, we should first clean it. We can do it by boiling the water. Boiling kills the germs in it. We can also clean water by using a water filter. In some houses, we get purified water when taps are connected to electrical water purifiers. Water as a scarce resource 
many people in India perform ceremonies to show their respect for water. It is especially common in places where water is scarce. They understand its importance and life-giving properties. If the total water on the earth were to fit into a 500 ml beaker, then the fresh water available to us is only one teaspoon. The rest is seawater or is locked up in icebergs. Less than 1% is finally available as fresh water. This is available as underground water, ponds, rain and river water. Now you can understand how precious is fresh water. We cannot drink seawater because it is too salty. It can be desalinized for use as drinking water through a very expensive procedure. However, it can be used to make salt. During the monsoons, seawater comes inland and fills up salt pans. It is kept in check by making dikes to prevent it from flowing back. Under the hot sun, the water evaporates, leaving behind a crusty layer of salt. This layer of salt is scraped and cleaned for use. Polluted water One of the most important properties of water is that it dissolves many substances. That is why it is used for cleaning and washing. Cleaning and washing make the water dirty. When this dirty water flows into the ponds, lakes and rivers, the water gets polluted. Water also gets polluted in many other ways. When people throw wastes and garbage into the rivers. When factories drain their wastes into the rivers. When people wash their clothes and take bath in rivers. When people urinate and defecate near a river. Polluted water is very harmful. It causes great damage to plants and animals living in water. Many of our rivers are grossly polluted. Polluted water also attracts flies, insects and mosquitoes to breathe there. Mosquitoes spread malaria, filaria and dengue. Polluted water also causes diseases like cholera, jaundice, typhoid, hepatitis and diarrhea. How to control water pollution? Here are a few steps which can be useful to control water pollution. Do not bathe, wash or clean utensils near the sources of water. Always use a clean bucket or vessel to draw out water from a well. Never throw garbage into a pond or river. Safe storage and handling of water. Water is so important that we cannot live without it. So, we should store and handle water carefully. We should take as much water as we need. We should store water in clean vessels. We must use a clean container to draw out the water. We should always take a short shower. We should turn off taps when not in use. Quick revision. Water is the only substance that exists in three forms, solid, liquid and gas. Our body needs about six glasses of water every day. Rain is the main source of water. Water cycle is a never-ending process. We should store and handle water carefully. Lesson 9. Food. From fields to homes. Our basic needs are food, clothing and shelter. Food is the most important need as we cannot live without eating. We get most of our food from plants. Fruits, vegetables, cereals, pulses, oil seeds and spices are grown in the fields by the farmers. Sources of food We get all our food items from two sources, plants and animals. Food from plants Cereals Plants give us cereals like rice, wheat and maize. Pulses Plants give us pulses like moong, masoor, urad, dry peas and kidney beans, rajma. Fruits and vegetables Plants give us fruits and vegetables like orange, cabbage, cauliflower, potato, tomato, etc. Remember, 
we get sugar from plants like sugar cane. Dry fruits. Plants give us dry fruits like walnuts, cashew nuts, and almonds. Spices. Chilies, cinnamon, cloves, black pepper, cardamom, turmeric, methi, and saffron are the spices we get from plants. We use spices to add flavor to our food. Oil seeds. We get oil seeds from plants like palm, sunflower, coconut, mustard, groundnut, etc. The oil obtained from these seeds is used for cooking and other purposes. Journey of food. When you have bread or cornflakes for breakfast or idlis and dosas for dinner, have you ever thought how these foods reach your plate? Let us learn about the journey of food. The food goes on a long journey before it reaches the final edible stage which we eat. Food like cereals, pulses and vegetables are grown by farmers. The farmer has to work very hard to cultivate these food crops. He goes through the following steps. The farmer prepares the soil by ploughing the fields. He uses ploughs to dig furrows in which seeds are sown. Often bullocks are used to pull the ploughs. Today, farmers also use tractors to plough the field. After the soil is prepared, the seeds are put in the furrows. This is called sowing of the seeds. For the proper development of crop plants, water is necessary. Water is supplied to the fields from tube wells, canals or wells. The farmers add manure and fertilizers to make the soil rich in minerals. They spray pesticides and insecticides to kill harmful insects and pests. To protect the crops from birds and animals, the farmers put up scarecrows. Once the crop ripens, it has to be cut. This is called harvesting. It is either done by sickles or by machines. The farmers pack the food crops in gunny bags, which are then transported in trucks and tractors to the wholesale market. Food grains, vegetables, fruits and spices are sold in different wholesale markets. Small storekeepers and vendors buy food from these wholesale markets. We buy food from shopkeepers. We buy cereals, pulses, sugar and oil from a grocer. We buy fruits from a fruit seller and vegetable from a green grocer. Do you know? Azadpur Mandi in Delhi is the largest vegetable and fruit wholesale market in India. Quick revision. We get all our food from plants and animals. The food goes on a long journey before it reaches the final stage which we eat. Lesson 10. Eating together. Eating together in a family. Our family is most important for us. It supports and gives us a lot of love and care. We share our joys and sorrows with our family. All the members of our family get together on holidays and also during evenings. While having our dinner together, we share our experiences and thoughts with our family members. Eating together begins at home. It creates a bond of oneness amongst all the family members. Eating together brings us closer to one another. We learn to love and respect one another in the family. Eating together on special occasions. We invite our friends and relatives on special occasions like birthday parties, festivals and picnics. Special dishes are cooked on these occasions. Sometimes we engage special cooks called halwai to prepare special food. He prepares the food in large vessels. The food is placed in serving bowls and served in good crockery. We all enjoy such feasts. Eating on such occasions brings joy and happiness in our lives. It creates a feeling of oneness amongst our family and friends. Eating together in a ceremony. When a large number of people eat together, it is called community eating. If you visit a Gurudwara, you will see 
there is a large group of people eating together. In Gurudwaras, food is prepared in large quantities in a common kitchen called Langar and served free of cost to the people. Thousands of people from different religions and castes, rich and poor, all sit together on the floor and eat the same food at a time. The Langar Prasad comprises chapatis, pulses, vegetables, salad and sweet dish. Many people enjoy working in the common kitchen in preparing langar or in distributing langar prasad as a seva, service to mankind. Such community eating develops the sense of service to human beings and oneness. Midday meal It is great fun to eat with friends. One gets to taste food from different states and regions. But some children are not as lucky as you are. They belong to poor families and cannot afford to eat good food. As a result, they are not well nourished and are unable to study well. To help such children, the Indian government has started a midday meal scheme in government-run primary schools. When the bell rings for the midday meal, all the children come out of their classes and wash their hands properly. They stand in a queue with their plates to take the midday meal. They all sit down in a row with their friends. They have a variety of food served on different days. Sometimes they have aloo puri, rice sambar, dal rice, idlis, rice with vegetables and gravy. On important days like Independence Day or Diwali, a special dish is served. The main advantages of a midday meal are it encourages children from the weaker section of the society to come to school. It provides employment to many people. It teaches basic eating habits and manners to children. It raises the sense of equality among children. It provides underprivileged children with a healthy meal and gives them the nutrition required for a healthy life. Eating together during lunch break We have a lot of fun during lunch break in our school. We all share our meals every day during lunch time. There is so much variety in food. Sharing our meals brings us closer to our friends. Eating together in a boarding hostel mess Some students study in a school where they live also. Such schools are called boarding schools. In boarding schools, all students sit together and eat the same food in a large dining hall called hostel mess. They are provided with fresh, properly cooked, hygienic food. They have fixed timings for different meals. The hostel warden and house masters make sure that the students eat properly. Quick revision. Eating together brings us closer to one another. When a large number of people eat together, it is called community eating. Sharing our meals brings us closer to our friends. In boarding schools, students are provided with fresh, properly cooked, hygienic food. Lesson 11. Teeth, Beaks and Claws Tasting Food We all have our favourite foods. We always say, I like to eat this. I do not like to eat that and so on. The tongue helps us to taste the food we eat. The surface of the tongue has taste buds. They are located in different areas of the tongue. We can identify four tastes. Sweet, sour, salty and bitter. The taste buds send signals to our brain through nerves. This is how we know if the food is salty, sour, bitter or sweet. The tongue the front, back and sides of our tongue are covered with little bumps called papillae. These bumps have groups of taste buds. Each taste bud has tiny nerves that send messages to your brain. Quick as a flash, your brain tells you what you are tasting. You know immediately whether the food is sweet, salty or bitter. Look at the picture given on the right to know the taste areas of the tongue. Our tongue helps us to swallow the food. 
It also helps us to talk. How do teeth help us? Our teeth are very important part of our body. They help us to chew food properly. Food can be digested well only when it is chewed properly. Our teeth also help us to speak clearly. That is why we find it difficult to understand the speech of old people who have lost their teeth. Teeth give proper shape to our face. As people grow old, they often lose their teeth and the shape of their face changes. Children are born without teeth. At first, they do not need food that has to be chewed. At the age of about six months, the first set of teeth appears through the gums. They are called milk teeth. You must have had 20 milk teeth. The milk teeth did not last for long. They fall out around the age of six. New teeth start growing in their place from the gums. This is your second set of teeth. They are 32 in number and are called permanent teeth. By the time you are about 14, you should have nearly all your permanent teeth. How many permanent teeth do you have now? Types of teeth There are four types of teeth. Incisors, canines, premolars and molars. This is how you have all your permanent teeth in your mouth. All your teeth work together to break food into little pieces so that it is easier for you to swallow and digest it. Structure of a tooth Each tooth consists of a visible white part called the crown. It is made of enamel, the hardest substance in your body. Underneath the enamel is dentine, which is similar to a bone but harder. The center of the tooth is made of pulp, which is softer. The pulp contains the nerves and it is through these nerves that you feel the pain of a toothache. Long roots keep the tooth anchored in the jaw. Animals and their teeth Herbivores or plant-eating animals such as cows, buffaloes, zebras, hippopotamus, horses, elephants, rhinos, goats and sheep have flat front teeth for biting off grass and leaves of plants. The back teeth are broad and are used for chewing and grinding. The front teeth of a hippopotamus are nearly 50 centimeters long. Its back teeth are smaller but broad for grinding leaves and grass. Cows first swallow all they eat and later sit down and bring back the food into the mouth to chew it slowly. This is called chewing the cud. Carnivores or meat-eating animals eat the flesh of other animals. Lions, tigers, whales and crocodiles eat meat. They have very strong, sharp front teeth to tear the flesh of the animals they eat. They also have sharp claws to grip the animal. Their strong back teeth help to grind the bones and flesh. They have four long pointed teeth called canines. Rodents such as squirrels, rabbits, hares, rats, guinea pigs and hamsters gnaw at their food. They have two pairs of sharp, narrow razor-like teeth to gnaw nuts, berries and a set of rigid teeth in the cheeks to chew. Elephants can dig for roots and water with their tusks. They also use them to fight other animals. Dolphins hunt fish and other prey. They use their teeth to puncture the prey, swallowing it whole or in large chunks without chewing. Bats have sharp and thin teeth to break insect shells. The anteater does not have any teeth. Instead, it has a sticky tongue to lick ants. Sharks have very strong teeth that are powerful enough to cut through a plate of steel. Their teeth keep wearing out and new row keeps reappearing. Sperm whales have large conical teeth only on their lower jaw. Birds and their beaks. Birds do not have teeth to help them break up their food. Instead, they have beaks. The beak of a bird is covered by horny plates and contains the bird's nostrils. The shape of a bird's beak shows us what it eats. 
owls and eagles have sharp, curved beaks for tearing flesh. A parrot has curved beak. It helps the bird to crack nuts and eat hard fruits. The beak also helps the bird to climb up the tree. Sparrows and finches have stout, cone-shaped beaks for opening seeds. A woodpecker has a very strong chisel-shaped beak. It uses its beak to make holes in the hard tree trunk. It also uses its beak to pull out insects from the holes. A duck has a flat, broad beak. The beak has tiny holes at the sides. When the duck takes muddy water into its beak, all the mud and water flow out through the holes, leaving the plants and insects inside the beak. Kingfishers and herons have sharp, pointed beaks. They use their beaks to catch fish from the rivers and ponds. A swallow has a broad, short and sticky beak. The bird moves round and round in the air, keeping its beak open. Thus, tiny insects get stuck in its beak. Claws Birds use their claws to catch and eat food. They also use their claws to protect themselves from their enemies and to move about. The claws depend on where a bird lives, how and what it eats. Eagles, vultures and owls have strong and sharp claws. They use their claws to catch prey like small rats, chicks, toads and other birds. Their claws are called talons. Hens have the habit of scratching the ground to bring out insects and seeds. They have strong and hard claws. Climbing birds like woodpeckers and parrots have two toes pointing upward and two toes pointing downward. These toes help them to climb up and cling to the branch. Birds like crows and sparrows perch on the branches. They have three toes in front and one toe at the back. These toes help the bird to hold on to the branch. The bird can even sleep while perching. Swimming birds like ducks have webbed feet. They have three toes in front and one toe at the back. The three front toes are joined by a skin. The skin is called a web. The webs make their feet like a paddle. They can push the water back while swimming. An ostrich has long, strong legs with two toes. It can run very fast. In fact, it is the fastest running bird in the world. Birds like cranes and herons have long legs with spreading toes. Their legs and toes help them wade through muddy water easily without getting wet. Quick revision. Our tongue helps us to taste the food we eat. Our teeth help us to chew food properly. We must take care of our teeth to prevent tooth decay. Birds use their beaks to peck, fight, hold their food and look for food on the ground, in water or in the mud. Lesson 12. Houses. Then and now. We all need a house to live in. A house protects us from heat, cold, rain, wild animals and thieves. We can keep our belongings safe in our house. A house gives us a comfortable and stable life. Houses long ago. Earlier, most people lived in villages and built kacha houses. It did not cost much then. It was usually made by family members themselves. Cow dung mixed with mud was used to make the floor. This would keep the insects away. They also used mud to build the four walls. Strips of wood were joined to make a frame and fixed on the four walls. Straw and leaves of trees like kikar and neem were placed on the frame so that termites would not harm the wood. Old gunny bags were placed on these leaves. This was covered with mud to make the roof. These houses were not very strong. They needed repair from time to time. Some people lived in a very big house. Space was not a problem those days. So most of the people built single-storied houses. They used limestone, stone chips, wood and mud bricks. 
most houses had rooms built around a central courtyard called the angan it was a place for the children to play in elders to sit and chat and for women to work there was a hand pump or a well in the angan for drawing water houses had high ceilings and thick walls these walls kept the house cool even in summer people did not need air conditioners or even fans in summer as we need today the kitchen was generally away from the living rooms so that smoke did not enter the rooms houses now time has changed now most of the people in cities and towns live in permanent houses called pakka houses these are made of materials like bricks cement tiles steel marbles iron and glass and glass the walls are made of bricks and plastered with a mixture of cement sand and water the flooring is made of marbles or stones bricks steel rods and cement are used for constructing the walls and roof wood and glass are used for making the doors and windows pakka houses are very strong they do not need repair frequently every house has all the modern facilities the toilet and the bathroom are inside the house pipes are put in the kitchen and toilet to remove the waste there is a proper drainage system houses are well ventilated with a number of windows and doors these houses are more expensive also nowadays there is a shortage of land in the cities this has resulted in construction of very tall buildings called multi-storied buildings they have many floors and each floor has a number of houses each house is called a flat or apartment some people live in a bungalow a bungalow has many rooms lawns garage etc some bungalows may also have a swimming pool there are many people involved in the construction of a house let us know who they are and what they do slums people from villages come to cities in search of work some of them work as domestic helpers mechanics construction laborers and factory workers they cannot afford to live in a rented house or build their own house so they make houses of whatever material they can gather and build shelters for their families in open spaces these areas are called slums slums are not legal colonies and have no facilities for hygienic toilets sewerage drinking water or electricity these slums are breeding grounds for germs and pests like rats and mosquitoes so they are prone to the spread of dangerous diseases fire is also a major threat in these areas the government is trying to provide low cost housing with basic facilities for people living in slums but it will take time to provide safe and sanitary houses for all quick revision a house protects us from heat cold rain wild animals and thieves the people in cities and towns live in permanent houses called pakka houses slums are not legal colonies and have no facilities for hygienic toilets sewerage drinking water or electricity lesson 13 homes of animals like human beings animals and birds also need homes to protect themselves from heat cold and rain birds build nests to protect themselves and animals take shelter under trees in dens and burrows animals living on land Animals that live on land are called terrestrial animals. Animals like elephants, giraffes and zebras live under the shade of trees in thick forests. Wild animals like tigers, lions and bears live in caves called dens. Some animals like monkeys, chimpanzees, squirrels and gorillas live on treetops. Animals that live on trees are called arboreal animals. animals living underground some animals like rats earthworms 
snakes and rabbits live in holes or burrows in the ground. Ants make ant hills with long tunnels. Termites live in underground colonies. Animals living in water. Some animals live in water. They are called aquatic animals. Fish and crocodiles live in water. Ducks live most of the time in water. Frogs can live both on land and in water. Birds make nest. Birds build nests to lay eggs. These nests hold their eggs until they hatch. Birds choose their nesting place with great care. They use a variety of things to make their nests. These include grass, feathers, leaves, twigs, hair, thread, a bit of paper or cloth, wool and stones. They make their nests cozy by lining them with soft things. Different birds build different types of nests. A tailor bird stitches leaves together with plant fibers or spider's web. The nest is lined with cotton, wool and dried grass to keep it warm. This makes the nest cozy and warm. As this bird sews its nest, it's called a tailor. The weaver bird weaves its nests from grass, fine strips of palm or banana leaves. The nest hangs from the branch. The entrance of the nest is from the lower side. This type of nest saves the eggs from being stolen by snakes. The woodpecker builds a nest in the tree trunk. It pecks the trunk with its beak to make a hole. Then it lines the hole with chips of wood to make it cozy. Eagles and vultures build their nest by simply putting a few twigs on top of a tree. Pigeons and sparrows make their nests in buildings or on trees. They use straws, leaves, grass and pieces of cotton or wool to make them cozy. Penguins simply make their nest by collecting pebbles and bones and laying them on the ground. The kingfisher digs a hole on the bank of a river. It makes the hole cozy with feathers and fish scales. The cuckoo or coil is a lazy bird. It does not build its nest, but it is a clever bird. It lays its eggs in the nest of a crow. The mother crow does not know this and hatches the cuckoo's egg and feeds the babies. The partridge scrapes the ground with its beak to make a hole. It uses dried grass and leaves to make the nest cozy. The partridge makes its nest in a place surrounded by bushes or tall grass. Parental Care Parents protect and feed their young ones in the nests until they are ready to fly on their own. They also help their young ones to fly. Spider's Web Spiders make their own web, which is a fine net of fibers. This net helps the spider to catch insects. They can make webs anywhere, though their favorite place is on the walls of old houses and dusty corners. A spider's web is also known as a cobweb. Animals seen at night only. Some animals, such as bats and owls, are seen only at night. Such animals are called nocturnal animals. During the daytime, they rest in their shelters. Owls build their nests in the hollows of trees or walls. They also use old buildings for making nests. Bats have skin-like attachments stretched between their toes which help them to hang upside down in tunnels, old buildings, tree branches or on wires. Man makes shelters for some animals. Some animals like cats and dogs are our pets. Some animals like cows, buffaloes, horses, sheep and hens are useful animals. They are tamed by us. They are called domestic animals. We provide shelter to our pets and domestic animals. Quick revision. Animals live in different types of houses. Animals that live on trees are called arboreal animals. 
birds make nests to lay eggs birds protect and feed their young ones in the nests until they are ready to fly on their own lesson 14 animals in transport you have studied the importance of animals they give us food wool leather etc they also help us in our work let's know how they help us in transport riding animals there are some animals that carry people from one place to another these animals are called riding animals people still use carts pulled by animals like horses and bulls to travel or to carry goods in villages in some hilly areas donkeys horses mules and ponies are used to travel from one place to another camels are also used as a means of transport in the deserts even today elephants camels and horses are used to give joy rides to people in towns and cities we often see them in fairs marriages and birthday parties horse carriages commonly known as tonga are still seen in some parts of mumbai they are a great tourist attraction the carriages may be pulled by two or a single horse they usually have only two wheels pack animals animals like camels donkeys ponies and mules that carry load are called pack animals they are also called beasts of burden pack animals are commonly used in deserts and mountains where there are no pakka roads heavy logs of wood or fallen tree trunks are carried or pulled by elephants in forests in the mountain ranges of himalayas yaks also carry goods draft or harness animals animals that pull carts plow fields draw water etc are called draft or harness animals animals like oxen donkeys and bullocks are some examples of draft animals taking care of animals like us animals are also living beings they also get tired and feel pain like us but unlike us they cannot speak to express their feelings we must be sensitive towards them and take care of their needs do not make them work for very long hours or overburden them with load provide pet and farm animals with proper shelter enough food and clean drinking water clean animals shelter regularly give animals proper rest if they fall ill take them to a veterinary doctor never tease animals clean the animals by giving them a bath regularly quick revision Horses, donkeys and mules are some examples of riding animals. Animals like elephants and camels are used to give rides in fairs, marriages, etc. Animals that carry load are called pack animals. Draft animals are used to plow fields, to draw water, etc. Lesson 15: Garbage disposal. We generate a lot of garbage at home. school and other places any material that is of no use is called waste or garbage in a city or town a large quantity of waste is produced in houses offices and factories however the quantity of waste is lesser in villages if all the waste is left in open areas it will become the breeding ground for germs and insects It will give rise to diseases like dysentery, diarrhea, typhoid, and cholera. It will also create a foul smell. We must get rid of these wastes to keep our surroundings clean. Types of waste. We can group wastes into biodegradable and non-biodegradable. Let's know the difference between these two types of wastes. Cover banana peels. and an empty oil bottle with some soil in an empty flower pot see the pot after a week when you will dig it out you will see that the bottle is still present in the soil whereas there is no sign of banana peels what happened to the banana peels 
it rotted away and mixed with the soil. So we see that some types of waste decompose or rot easily and mix with the soil. Such waste is called biodegradable waste. All food waste, vegetable and fruit peels, leaves, grass, flowers and paper are biodegradable wastes. Solid waste that does not decompose easily and mix with soil is called non-biodegradable waste. Items such as plastics, metals and glass are non-biodegradable. They stay unchanged in the soil for a very long time and also pollute the soil. If animals like cows, goats, buffaloes, sheep etc. eat them, they may fall sick or even die. Disposal of solid wastes Keeping the surroundings clean and disease-free is our responsibility. Let us understand how the garbage from our houses is disposed of. We pick up all the waste produced in our home and throw them into a dustbin. The sweepers collect garbage from our homes and dump it into big public garbage bins. The municipal corporation's trucks carry this garbage away from the city. The wastes are disposed of in three different ways. Open dumping, sanitary landfilling and incineration. Let us know more about them. Open dumping. In this method, the waste is thrown in open to decompose with the action of air, water and sunlight. But this is a harmful method because the area becomes a breeding ground for insects and germs. This increases the risk of spreading diseases. It also results in an unpleasant smell in the surroundings. Sanitary land filling. In this method, deep and big bits called landfills are dug outside the cities. The waste taken by the municipal corporations, trucks, are dumped in these landfills. Then these pits are covered with a thick layer of soil or a stone slab. This is a safe method of disposing of solid waste because the waste will decompose in the landfills and mix with the soil. This soil can be used as manure. It does not provide any breeding ground for insects or germs, so there is hardly any risk of spreading diseases. It does not produce any foul smell. Incineration In cities, solid wastes are sometimes burnt in big furnaces called incinerators. This method is called incineration. It does not allow insects or germs to breed. It also does not cause any foul smell, but incinerators cause air pollution due to release of smoke. Controlling Waste Generation We generate a lot of wastes every day. Option. We generate a lot of waste every day. It has become a serious problem to dispose of these wastes. So we should try to control the wastes generated by us. We can do it by following the method of reduce, reuse and recycle. This is popularly known as the three R's. Reduce. We must buy only those things we need and can use. If we buy too many fruits or vegetables, some might go bad and add to the garbage. Here are a few ways to reduce waste. Avoid buying things with lots of packaging material. Avoid buying items like plastic glass, cups, tins, thermocol plates, etc. which have only one time use. Use steel utensils. Carry a cloth bag for shopping. Avoid using plastic bags. Reuse. Reusing means finding new uses for things that would be normally thrown away. Many items can be reused. This saves money and also puts waste to good use. Here are a few ways to reuse items. We can reuse empty glass or plastic jars for storing things like pickles, pulses, sugar, etc. We can use biscuit and cheese tins for keeping clips, buttons, needles, etc. We can give our textbooks to our juniors for reuse. 
we can cut old clothes and reuse them as napkins, dusters, etc. We can give clothes or toys which we no longer use to the needy. Recycle Recycle means converting used items into raw materials and then making new products from them. These new products can be used by us again. Here is a way to recycle paper. Paper is the most common item used in every home. A kabadiwala collects all the waste papers from our houses. He sends the waste paper to the recycling factories. Here, paper is converted into pulp. The paper mills convert pulp into paper again. Some factories make paper products like cards, paper flowers, paper plates, toilet paper, paper bags, notebook, etc. from recycled paper. Recycling of paper Other items we give to the kabadiwala for recycling may be glass, used bulbs, glasses and jars, crockery, metals, cupboards, containers and refrigerators, plastics, toys, containers, bottles, bags, buckets, etc. Advantages of Recycling By recycling newspapers and magazines, fewer trees need to be cut to make new paper. In the same way, by recycling metals, lesser amount of mining of these metals will have to be done. Recycling reduces the amount of waste and solves the problem of waste disposal. By recycling, we get raw material for making new articles again. Thus, by following the golden rule of the three R's, we will be able to save a lot of money and natural resources. Moreover, we save the environment from the ugly hands of waste or garbage. Quick Revision Any material that is of no use is called waste or garbage. Wastes that decompose easily and mix with the soil are called biodegradable wastes. Solid wastes that do not decompose easily and mix with the soil are called non-biodegradable waste. Lesson 16. Travel and Currency Shifting from one place to another Sometimes people move from one place to another due to transfer of job, getting a new job or some other reasons. It gives people some good as well as some bad experiences. Let's know about a family which has shifted in Panaji from Jodhpur. I'm Amit and this is my sister Rani. I'm in class 4 and my sister is in class 2. My father is an Air Force officer and my mother is a housewife. My father gets transferred every 2 or 3 years. We moved from Jodhpur in Rajasthan to the city of Panaji in Goa about four months ago. These places are very different from each other, but we adjusted very easily because we are used to moving around. We have travelled by road, sea and air. At every new place, we learn to adjust with new people, different climates and homes. We always live in the cantonment which has houses for families of Air Force personnel. I have also learnt a bit of Odia, Bengali and Punjabi because we have stayed in places where these languages are spoken. Can you guess which states I have visited? I enjoy travelling by train. What is your favourite mode of transport? Bus, train, ship or aeroplane? Jodhpur is a very beautiful city. It is completely surrounded by the desert. It becomes very hot in summers. Sometimes there are desert storms. The sky becomes red and there is sand everywhere. There is hardly any rainfall. Jodhpur has many strong forts and palaces. The people are tall and very hard working. They are known for their bravery. There are many historical places worth visiting in Jodhpur. In Panaji, we are living near the beach. I love the sea and the beaches. But my sister is a little afraid of the water. 
The weather is hot and humid, though the evening brings cool sea breeze. The people of Goa are very friendly. People here eat a lot of seafood. Goa is famous for churches. Many tourists visit Goa. There are beautiful hotels in Goa. Some of the favorite dishes of the local people are chicken zakuti, sorpotel, and bebinka. Every year, an exciting festival or carnival is organized with music, dance, and other events. Paying for travel. Sometimes one has to move to another city or town. We must make the best out of such situations. We have so much to learn from other people. We should be positive and think of the new places we will see and the new friends we can make in those places. Do you know anyone who has travelled very far from your town or city? Suppose you are going on a bus journey. What is the first thing you do after sitting down in the bus? Obviously, you buy a ticket. The conductor sells tickets in the bus. In a train, the train ticket examiner, TTE, checks your tickets. Air travel is more expensive than bus or train travel. Money for traveling. We need to buy tickets for our travel. To buy our tickets, we have to pay money. We need to buy a ticket for the fuel used by the bus, train or aeroplane we use for traveling. The services they provide while traveling. We use currency notes and coins to pay. Money made of paper are called currency notes. Money made of metal are called coins. Every country has its own currency. The Indian currency is known as the rupee. Its symbol is R. The Reserve Bank of India has the sole authority to issue currency notes in India. It changes the design of the currency notes from time to time. The Story of Money In olden days, shells were used as money. Paper money was first printed in China. The history behind the making of currencies, the tinkling coins and crisp notes is interesting. Trade existed long before the invention of currency. The main form of payment was the barter system. In the barter system, currency was not used. Only goods were exchanged. A farmer who cultivated rice would exchange it for some clothes or utensils he needed. This kind of exchange was possible only between two needy persons. So, man wanted to find an alternative to the barter system. The idea of exchanging goods for a given value led man to produce coins. When man realized that it was not convenient to carry coins and move around, paper money was invented. They were called currencies. Every country has its own currency. The currency of USA is called US dollar. And the currency of France is Euro. Japanese currency is called Yen. While the currency of Singapore is called Singapore Dollar. Faces of a currency note A currency note has two faces. On one face, the value of the currency is written, both in figures and words, in the center of the currency. Below the value is the signature of the governor of the Reserve Bank of India. A picture of Mahatma Gandhi is on the right-hand side of the currency note. We have the picture of a national emblem at the bottom on the left-hand side. Reserve Bank of India gives a particular code number to every currency note. No two notes can have the same code number. The code number is printed at the top right-hand corner and bottom left-hand corner of a currency note. Our national emblem consists of four lions, but we can see only three lions. They are on a pedestal. These lions represent power, courage and confidence. The pedestal rests on a circular base. 
A wheel appears in the center of the base with the bull on the right and a horse on the left. Below the national emblem, the motto Satyamev Jayate is inscribed. It means truth alone triumphs. Our national emblem has been taken from the Ashoka's pillar at Sarnath. On the other face, each currency note has a picture of national importance. On the left hand side, the value of the currency is written in words in 15 regional languages of India. Coins The government of India has the sole right to mint coins. The coins in the denomination of 50 paise, 1 rupee, 2 rupees, 5 rupees and 10 rupees are minted. A coin also has two faces. On one face of the coin, the value is written both in figures and in words. This is given in the center. Look at the two faces of coins used in India. Ask your grandparents which coins they used when they were children. They used different coins of lower denominations but could buy more. Do you know why? Things were cheaper in their times. These coins are no longer in use. Here are some of them. Quick revision. People move from one place to another for their jobs, education and other reasons. In a train, the train ticket examiner, TTE, checks our tickets. We need to buy a ticket for the fuel used by the bus, train or aeroplane. Reserve Bank of India gives a particular code number to every currency note. The Government of India has the sole right to mint coins. Lesson 17. Mapping the Neighborhood Man is a social being. He cannot live alone in a locality. There are many houses near ours. People living in these houses are called our neighbors. The area around our house is our neighborhood. Mapping means making a drawing that will help us find the location of a place. It is very important for us to know the directions to a place we want to visit. There are many buildings in our neighborhood which provide services to us. Schools, hospitals, post offices, police stations, petrol pumps, markets and shopping malls are some of them. To reach a place we are not familiar with, we need to know the directions. Directions there are four directions, east, west, north and south. If you face the rising sun, that is the east. West lies behind you, north lies to your left and south is to your right. Sketch A sketch is a rough picture that is drawn quickly to show the route you take to get from one place to another. A sketch is not exact in measurement. Ritu invited her friend Kalpana for her brother's birthday party. Kalpana does not know the location of Ritu's house. Ritu's mother made a sketch for Kalpana. She marked some important landmarks in the sketch to help Kalpana find her way. It was difficult to draw all the landmarks on the way from Kalpana's home to Ritu's home. So, Ritu's mother used symbols for landmarks. A landmark is a place or thing that you can easily recognize. Temples, schools, cinema halls, parks, malls, etc. are commonly shown as landmarks. A symbol is a sign representing a landmark. Symbols are used to save space and show more details. A symbol usually has the shape of the thing it represents. It has the same meaning whenever used. After looking at the sketch, Kalpana found it easy to locate Ritu's home. Map A map is a drawing of a neighborhood, a village, a city, or a country, or the earth on a paper. We can take the help of a road map to locate a place in a city. Road maps show all the roads of a city. 
we can get them at bookshops, bus stands and railway stations. In a colony, we can also see a colony map displayed at the entrance gate. With the help of this colony map, we can easily locate any house located in that colony. Finding directions on a map. In a map, north is always at the top. The bottom of the map indicates the south. East is towards the right and west is towards the left. Other directions like northeast or southwest lie appropriately in between. Understanding symbols. Since space in a map is limited, symbols and colors are used to convey information. Some of the important symbols and signs used in maps are given below. Metal road, unmetalled road, footpath, railway line, A. Broad gauge, B. Meter gauge, bridge, stream, well, national capital, state capital, Temple, Mosque, Church, Post Office, International Boundary, State Boundary, Colors in Maps In the maps, different colors are used to show different places. Color, Places Blue, Water Bodies like Oceans, Seas, Rivers, Lakes Green, Plains Yellow, Highlands Dark Brown, Mountains and hills, white, snow. Scale in maps. The earth is huge in size, so it is not possible to show its actual size in the map or on a piece of paper. Maps are very small in size. Therefore, a tool named the scale is used to show distances on the map. This is called the scale of the map. For example, the actual distance between Delhi and Haridwar is about 200 kilometers. But if we measure the distance on a map, we find that the distance between them is 2 centimeters. Hence, we can say that a distance of 200 kilometers on the ground is shown through 2 centimeters on the map. Scale 1 centimeter is equal to 100 kilometers. If the distance between two cities is shown as 4.2 centimeters on the same map with the same scale as above, can you tell the actual distance between these two cities? Maps act like our guides as they provide us with very useful information. Quick revision. The area around our house is our neighborhood. A sketch is a rough drawing which shows the way from one place to another. East, West, North and South are the four directions. Symbols are used to denote roads and railway lines. A map is a picture of a place drawn to scale. Colors are used to show different features of the place.